Wait, what was the other question? My name, my pronouns, then what I, my, my connection, connection to the theater community. Right. So, uh, so I work at Signet Theater. I'm in the box office there. Uh, I also help with the marketing and the event planning. Uh, but I've been a big fan of San Diego Theater. I've been born and raised here. So I've been pretty much everywhere. And I'm very proud to be the founder of a new up and coming company called Patrick Theater Company that I started, which is based around Zoom Theater. All right. Thank you. Daniel? Hi, my name is Daniel Jaques, and I go by the pronouns he, him, his. Um, I've been in San Diego for three years. Um, I'm a theater director. I'm one of the co-founders of Do Your Theater here that we started a couple of years ago. And um, uh, based on a commons leadership approach and see, uh, trying to struggle how that structure uh, functions to the best of its abilities. And um, I think that is it. Awesome. Well, thank you. I just want to thank you all again for agreeing to be open to this kind of discussion to this evening. Um, so let's begin with our first question. How would you define intersectionality and how do you incorporate that in the work that you do? It's a two-parter, so it's a little bit hefty there. Um, if you would like to answer the question, raise your hand and I can call on you so that we have a little bit of organization to this. Um, where do I read? Oh, my actual hand. Yeah. You can see. <laughs> it's a deep one. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll Go start. It. Um, it's um, it's 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 actually easier than than what it is if you're actually open to see it. I I define it uh, basically as um the original coiner of it, Candace, Candace Crenshaw. She, she wrote a, a paper on it and, and started defining intersectionality based on um, that, that the, the, the cumulative of, of oppression is, um, is stronger than just like, or you're just female or you're just black and, and together it's kind of worse and, and, and doesn't get justice. Um, uh, I define that as knowledge that other people are oppressed, you know? I think, um, yeah, I also think that's that's kind of like the definition. Now, to tackle it, it would be a sense of empathy that you would have to develop. Um, a lot of us have it naturally, a lot of us don't, uh, but I still think it's a trained uh, skill that we have to develop to open our eyes. And the only way to develop uh, that vision and that empathy that an empathy that comes with action, not necessarily just, oh, I feel sorry for you, and, you know, that kind of work. Um, yeah. Thank you. All right. So, and I, just to clarify, you know, Crenshaw, Kimberly Crenshaw, she's a Black feminist. Um, she does mm -hmm. have a, a text written called The Black Feminist Critique of Anti-Discrimination Doctrine. So you can definitely look in there for more information about intersectionality. And August, I did see your hand raised. So go ahead, please share with us. I was just going to agree with Daniel uh, in the his sort of framing of the two parts to intersectionality. Uh, at first, there is the, uh, in my mind, the notion that um, Kimberly Crenshaw uses the idea that um, the experience of Black womanhood couldn't be reducible to being Black or a woman. There's a way that these um, institutions of power and knowledge uh, all overlap with each other in a way that's not reducible to like class or gender or race or sexuality. They all come together um, and we all have a set of um, privileges and oppressions that can't be like pulled apart from each other. Uh, and intersectionality is an, an acknowledgement that we have to um, dig deeper and we can't, there's not just one way to look at um, politics or like the human experience. Um, but I think that the second part is like, cool, we have the description, but then there's intersection, intersectional practice, which um, relies heavily on this, um, the fact that so many of us are caught up in so many different um, uh, relations of power um, that all of our struggle, it's the realization that all of our struggles are the same struggle um, in the same, um, I actually read a little while ago about uh, during the AIDS epidemic, 
you know, the government not caring about marginalized people in the face of a pandemic. Oh, how history repeats itself. Um, <laughs> um, uh, that um, inmates um, who are at a high risk for age, as well as um, LGBT activists, found solidarity together because together, they realized that their struggle was the same one against the government who did not care about them and they were saying, um, facing the same problems. And so intersectionality as practice is really uh, finding affinities with people who maybe on the surface, it's not like necessarily like clear um, to everyone in either like group, whether you're talking specifically about like um, black issues or like women's issues, uh, but there are like black women and they inhabit like both of these positions and the fight for the liberation of one is the same as the fight for the liberation of the other. Thank you. Thank you. I agree. <laughs> All right. I see some snaps too. I think we're feeling this. I appreciate that. All right. Candace, please share with us. Um, I just want to say, you two put it beautifully. And I, I will say as a Black woman, it is one thing that I think we struggle with on a daily basis is when does my Blackness supersede my womanness and vice versa? And it's so difficult to navigate. And in my work and in working with others, that's something that I love to explore for actors. You know, you're playing this character, you're playing this role, you've taken this on, and your relation to, do, to these two things may be very different based on who you are as an individual versus who your character is or who you're trying to be in this character and embody. So I, I find that um, as far as intersectionality goes and in theater, we have to do a better job, if you will, of allowing our actors to bring what they have to the table in addition to the fact that our actors need to be willing to stand up for themselves and say, yes, you may have cast this role X, Y, or Z way, but there's another aspect that goes into it, particularly from the directorial side is if, if I'm, not, I'm not a white woman, so I can't talk about how white womanhood comes to a certain character, but that's something I should be able to help my actor pull from themselves or discover or discuss and be open to that discussion as well, especially when we do all come from so many different backgrounds. Nicely put, thank you. All right, Keon, please share with us. Yeah, literally to bounce off of really what Candace just said, I agree fully. Everybody's saying pretty much what I'm feeling um, because yeah, I, I look at intersectionality as a, as a practice in empathy, right? And it's a practice in understanding that just like Candace said, just like everybody's saying, we, we come from different backgrounds, we come from different stories, right? But that also enhances something in, in, in how you do things because I know for myself when I direct, um, you know, I approach everybody as equals, right? I, I, I make it clear that it's like, I may have the title of director, you may have the title of actor, but we're all here to work on one collective project and one collective story, right? And it's like, like Ken's saying, it's like, we have the character story, but then you have your story, right? And you have your voice and you have your experience. And we should be able to be allowed to talk about that and have open dialogue and have open conversation because you'd be surprised at what it actually brings to the process. Um, and so I just think, you know, that's what theater is about. It's like, it's about celebrating the human experience. It's about celebrating what makes us special. Um, so for me, yeah, to literally just reiterate, I agree 100% wholly. I'm very much all about just like, if you can believe in someone, right? And you can believe in what they have to say and who they are, then what else can you do, right? It's like, just believe in what they have to say and believe in the person that they're trying to be, so. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you all for that, for those definitions and building upon each other's definitions of intersectionality and also including about how you use that in your work as, as actors, as directors. And if you would like to jump in here, please feel free to raise your hand as well. But also considering um, from other sides, like what about choosing plays? How does choosing plays become a part of intersectionality? What, what should... Um, artistic directors or theater heads be looking for? How should they go about looking for that? Mm -hmm. That's probably too many questions at once. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. Danielle, you're already unmuted. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, you're fine. Well, well um, is, I think we could still go deeper in the defi definition of intersectionality and the practice of it. It's, uh, for example, um, we didn't acknowledge the land that was taken from the original. Where we're, where we're doing it, you know, I want to take a moment to acknowledge um, the original peoples of this land, the Kumie, and, um, and the land was taken. And, and, and the reason I, besides making it a, a we, cannot, we, we cannot continue with, with 
with ignoring the past. And while I'm saying that, there's also this whole thing of identifying who is intersectional, what is it, what, you know, there's sexual orientation, there's disability, there's class, age, race. Um, whose responsibility is it to define your intersection? Right? You have to ask. But if somebody asks as in an institution, um, because there's a lot of things that are not obvious, we have to do our work as, as intersectional human beings also to, to know what we walk in, in the door with. Um, yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. We do need to examine ourselves as soon as we walk into a place. And also we do need to continually be cognizant of the erasure that is happening in our daily lives. We may mm -hmm. not notice it because it's constantly being erased, but that's where we have to work on ourselves as individuals to be like, okay, what am I forgetting? Who am I leaving out of this conversation? Who am I leaving out of this experience, this opportunity? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, and, one, and once you know it, you, you don't have to code switch. Let everybody else deal with it. <laughs> I'm sorry, I really love that. Once you know, you don't have to code switch, let everyone else deal with it, especially as somebody who has to survive, it seems like, on code switching. Um, so much of us have like, you know, just my appearance this way gives people an immediate reaction about who I should be, who what they think that I am. But again, um, Blackness is not a monolith. Yes, we have our shared experience, our shared oppression, and our shared history, but we're all different individuals. And I've got different things in my background than the next person. And that's something that we all have to consider. I may mm -hmm. be privileged in some ways and unprivileged and underprivileged in others and not privileged in any, in any other ones. So that's something to consider. August, did I see your hand raise? i just making oh, sure. Yeah, I appreciate, I appreciate it. Um, once again, two things from Danielle. Um, the, uh, I think that um, indigeneity uh, is something that often is lacking from our discussions. Well, obviously we're existing in like a moment of, um, uh, that is centering on uh, black racial politics. Um, we also like have to understand that, um, well, I guess in so much discussion about race and intersectionality, um, people will say, uh, whether you're black, Asian, Mexican, uh, but rarely do people talk about indi indigeneity or indigenous people. And uh, if, you know, if you want to be scholarly about it, if you um, are to say that the current black condition is slavery, then the current indigenous condition may be invisibility um, mm -hmm. because of the like long history of like erasure of indigenous people, uh, faces, voices, and cultures. Um, but I also think that um, in dis deciding who is intersectional, that's a really important point. From my understanding, uh, intersectionality is not just an analysis of oppressions. Um, I am relatively young and I deal with a lot of young people. And so uh, people talk like often get into the trap of focusing on like who like who is the most oppressed and that's the most intersectional, which is not a useful way because we all exist at intersections. Intersectionality is about um, oppressions and privileges. Um, uh, like I am light skinned, I come from a decent middle class background. Um, but we are all, every single person who is here watching in the world is in some sense intersectional due to like the fact that all of us operate within the same systems, we just operate differently. Nicely put. Yes, we definitely all operate in the same systems, but we all operate differently. We all got different rules depending on either our status, our gender, things like that. That's where that intersectionality comes again to play. And I, I want to jump off a little bit about what August was mentioning before about our current political moment. So given this current political climate that we are in and, and the movement for Black Lives Matter and how that's also connecting to, as people are now starting to see, connecting to other movements, how do you um, incorporate anti-racism, anti and let me rephrase this because of words, how is anti-racism going to be incorporated in your intersectional framework as a theater artist or as whatever else you do, but specifically I'm looking for theater if you have that, but I would also be open to hearing in society at large because we know that once we leave those theater doors or once we leave that stage, there's that real world again coming at us like it never really left. So how do we incorporate being anti-racist, but still in an intersectional framework? Candace. I think uh, the real truth of it all is we have to acknowledge racism exists. Um, 
you know, it's, it's like that big elephant in the room that no one wants to talk about. And my biggest thing with people, I don't care what you look like, who you are, we can have an open and honest discussion with each other and walk away in an agreement to disagree. And that is fine. But ultimately there are certain things that are fundamentally right. And there are certain things that are fundamentally wrong. And for what, for me and in picking shows that we do, we're theater people. We have a job to educate people on top of entertain them. So when you can kind of find those two things and mesh them together, um, that was something when I had the opportunity to do Clybourne Park. I was like, to my boss, I was like, Sean, I want to do this show and I want to talk about all the reasons we want to do these things. And then having those open and honest conversations with the artistic directors and the managing directors about, is this a show that brings some sort of value to the community, number one? Number two, is there an educational component? And then number three, having an open discussion with your cast. I mean, there were things that when we did that show, we discussed that I don't think some of my actors had ever discussed before. And that's not in a bad way. Or there were things I didn't know and my stage manager knew more about. And I was like, oh, I didn't see it like this or whatever it may be. So I think it's important that when we are picking shows or choosing shows to be a part of, that we do the work that comes with that. I, I can't pick a show and then cast an actor in a role and not give them all of the tools or have someone involved in the process who can give them all of the tools to help them understand something. I mean, there was a theater, I believe it was in Atlanta that was trying to put on a show about Pocahontas and didn't understand why the director didn't want the kids showing up in um, Indian or Native American attire, excuse me. And I was like, um, well, she's Native American and she is telling you it's offensive. We have to be willing to listen and we have to be willing to take the action because I wouldn't necessarily know that if someone says to me, let me educate you on my culture. I need to sit down and I need to be willing to listen and have that dialogue so that I better understand it. Um, so that, that's just, that's what it boils down to for me as far as picking shows and casting people in shows and knowing your actor's level of comfort or your designer's level of comfort. Because if I put someone in a position that ultimately scars them, I can't forgive myself for that. So I have to do the work and also making sure I'm checking in with my actors and saying, are you comfortable with this? Are you comfortable with that? Where is the limit and why is this not okay? Because I need to learn this now so that I can help myself in the future and help future actors and future audiences and anyone else who wants to be a part of that process. Thank you. That was very insightful. I'm glad to hear that you are having those conversations because those do need to happen. I've been in a few productions where they, the production team wasn't as responsible, I guess you would say. Um, and most of the time, most of it was when I was really young before I moved here and in Kansas. So um, yeah, they were doing Big River. Mm, so hmm. Fun times, not really. But it, it taught me a lot about, you know, just the way that people do have that kind of sense of like, this is okay, it has been socially acceptable. And so now it comes to bringing down, coming down to the fact to breaking down that wall of socially acceptable racism and trying to find culturally responsible um, responses to one another. How do we take care of each other better? Um, anybody else would like to add on to that? Yes, Keon, go ahead. Um, yeah, I think that right now in this current climate, you know, I think especially looking at the lens of theater, we are being asked to change. We are given the, we are right now given the opportunity to look at everything that we've been doing for the past who knows how many years and go, I'm sorry, this has not been working. We need to change this. And it comes in every form between your casting, who you're hiring on your staff, who you do, like your marketing, the way that you are hiring your designers. I mean, it, it, like, it boils down to all the small things, but I think that most importantly, it, in my opinion, begins with creating the space where it's like, we, we are equal, right? It, it's, it's like, it's beginning to acknowledge that maybe that POC actor comes in and you're like, well, I could cast, you know, the same person I've used 8,000 times, or I could take a risk and cast somebody who I haven't had before and walk in the room and go, well, you know what? I believe in you and I wanna hear what your story says. And it may take a little bit of work because you're new, but I'm gonna take that chance with you. And it's, it's just beginning to develop those small things and leaving the comfortability that we've had for so long, right? Because I think that, well, it's not awful. There was so many problems with it. And 
it's like we haven't been able to sit down and be like this is a problem and so now the time is about acknowledging the time is about holding each other accountable and it's about listening and having like candace said action you can write beautiful statements you can write beautiful things you can you know say you'll do all these things but if the action is not there nobody will we will all see it like it's like you can write that thing but if you're not putting the words if you're not putting your money where your mouth is nobody cares so do it don't be scared I love that. So acknowledgement, accountability, um, you know, say what you need to say, have the discussion, but then act on it. Great, great, great. And Danielle, I saw your hand. Please go ahead. Uh, wow, there's a lot to say. Um, first of all, I, th I think um, um, in terms of intersectionality and the current movement right now, uh, the uh, Black Lives Matter, I think I'm dropping everything theatrically and just focus it on, on make uh, black people successful because when, when, um, I mean, if they come in f for you, they're going to come for me later. <laughs> you know, it's that kind of thing that that's, we've always let things pass and let things pass. And I think, um, if that's part of the intersectionality, no, no, when, when your 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 goals are the same or will be accomplished by removing the big stumbling block that's been abused since for 400 years you know what is that about um that's 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 one thing um another thing i think uh i i mean even in my latino my latinx theater company it's it's hard. We we look for Afro Latinas and where are they? You know, we've invited. Hello, <laughs> exactly. Uh, we've invited several people to do things, and most people are busy. How do we create this environment where where talented people uh, stay in town? You know, um, I also been thinking a lot about theater no longer as entertainment, but as as um, it's it's a social change you know it's 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 like your invitation to this talk it's about justice you know we cannot the theater's role now should be about justice whatever that means because the word justice is for everybody um yeah i think i've yeah that's what i want to say and there's a lot of links there's a lot of documents that give a lot of specifics. I don't know if you guys know, but there is all this, um, like like Center Theater Group, uh, other big companies, the 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 BIPOC uh, staff and artists wrote statements on how they would uh, come back if if unless these things changed, and they're they're really powerful and very specific. So there is a to do list there, but I invite you all to to do our own list on what we need here in the San Diego theater for us to come to work. Nice, yeah, I, I would love to do that. Keon. Yeah, I, um, I, I really do believe in that. I, I've had a lot of time to sit and think about what I would, not what I would, what I would change, but what I think. I think that right now, once again, not to be like, oh, this moment, but it's like, we have to all remember that uh, at least like, the five of us here, right? Um, and for any youngins out there, whoever, right? Like, we are the future of theater, right? And not saying that we cannot, we can't ignore the people who haven't created the space for us because that's disrespectful, right? We can't, we couldn't have gotten here. We couldn't have had these dreams if we didn't see these people do what we wanted to do. And now we're doing that too. However, it's now time, I think, to shift that internal responsibility, right? And go, thank you for being the keeper of the keys. Now it's my time to throw the keys away and create a community where we're all gonna do this together and we're all gonna create this better future for us by taking that step with each other. And I think I agree with, with Danielle. I think it's time to create a list, right? Whatever that means, maybe it's five things. I've done it, right? I've created five things about like if, when I, when these doors open again, when we go, okay, we're gonna come back to this and we're gonna slowly get into this. I think we should all write something Load your artistic director's inbox, sorry, but I'm just like, tell them, be like, hey, I love you and I want you to hear me because I value you, you value me, we're artists, let's change this together. Hold it, like I said, accountability, I'm off my high horse. 
Yes, accountability. I mean, that that's, it comes down to a lot of that, especially when you're asking people who have been in power for so long to do what they need to do for the communities that have been marginalized or ignored or even erased. So thank you. Anybody? Oh, Candace. Sorry, I, I promise I'll be done after this one. Um, I do I do want to speak on what Kiki said because I do think it's so, so important that we talk about leadership and what leadership looks like. I'm not asking for anyone to leave their positions. I'm asking for people to just be open. And a, even more importantly, when we're picking our seasons, and I, I hate to bring it back to this, but when we pick our seasons, don't just call a director and say, oh, I want you to direct the Black play. No, call me because you believe in my talent and you want me to pitch you something. Don't call me because I need a black director. I need someone to make us look good. I can make you look good doing what I wanna do, not doing what you want me to do. Because it may be a show I don't even like, or it may be a show that I'm not interested in, or it may be a show that I know three other directors I can call and say they'd be a better fit for you. But don't only call us when you need us. Call us because you actually want us in your theaters. Call us because you want us a part of those discussions. Give us a seat at the table. Don't just bring it when it's convenient. Okay, I'm done. See, all our high horses are coming out. That's, that's what's happening. Thank you so much for that, Candace. All right, I saw, I saw August. I think August is waiting and then we'll go down to Daniel. So August, go ahead. Um, I wanted to point something valuable out. I found in like what Candace just said um, in that um, you know, it, why is it the assumption that, oh, uh, call Candace, we got a black play. Um, it's a lot of the issue that I think, um, because I, I think the majority of people in the San Diego theater community wouldn't say, yeah, I'm a racist. Um, uh, and yet there are, um, there's this thing, institutional racism, which is like a big phrase right now, but an important idea is that with no, their systems, can produce racist results with nobody individually like acting w out of like racial malice. Uh, it's, and I think a large part of it is these sort of like assumpt assumptions or biases that are so unassuming that they're like hard to point out and hard to tackle. And I think part of like this discussion and this work that like we're all doing is trying to um, wake people up to the sort of assumptions they didn't realize they were making. Um, it's like, oh, huh. Um, why, why aren't I hiring like uh, people of color in non like um, racial plays um, for um, and in all aspects? I mean, um, I'm sure sh there's a lot more um, things. Um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. But I think part of the work is, uh, hey, why do you think that way? Or does this really need to be like that? Uh, it's the little things that um, I think add up and it's a shift in the way that we think about inclusion because um, representation um, is not obviously sufficient. Uh, it needs to be people of color are a part of every aspect of the theater community uh, and not just put on stage when you need one. Yes, yes, exactly. Yes, sorry, as an actress, I felt that some kind of way. Um, okay, Danielle, I saw you, you were waiting, thank you. Um, no worries. Um, uh, so just a couple of points, like Candace, um, I think you're totally correct that the issue of, of uh, build a relationship with the artists and work on what they create and, and what they love to do, because that's what they're going to give a better um, product, to call it a product, even though I don't think theater should be a commodity. But, um, you know, um, the other thing is, uh, I think it's a phrase that should live forever, August, the, the institutionalized racism because, un, until it's gone, because we're, we're getting to a point where, where we identify it. Um, and I think a lot of the comments and conversations I've had lately, uh, people are finally acknowledging. Uh, I don't want to bring back trauma, but um, that Amy video, uh, Amy Cooper video brought on a lot of like, oh shit, I do that too. Um, the American Repertory Theater issue uh, with um, with uh, how how a black artist was treated in rehearsals of of his play that was also a, a very specific moment that starts resonating with with people that are leading theaters or or. 
have been running them for a while that they don't realize that this happens and how bad it really is and how they feel it. Um, yeah. Oh, thank you. That's true. It's been a wake up call for lots of people. Not enough though, because it's still happening, unfortunately. We, we um, can't stop. We can't. We're, we're working on it. I think more the fact that we bring that awareness, you know, that acknowledgement of this, that this is an issue and we can continue to see it because thankfully we, most of us have phones in our po or cameras in our pocket now. So hopefully people will understand that this is something that, you know, does need to change as well. I do want to ask you all a question that I got um, from the Q&A real quick because it was topical to this. Um, when we're talking about um, intersectional issues of race, what about thinking about it as terms of theater education and how it affects the theaters around town in terms of casting or teaching students of theater? As a theater educator myself, I'm very, very excited to hear what you all have to say about that. Candace. Education ultimately starts at home. Um, I'm not here to raise anyone's child. I am here to present theater to your child. And my biggest issue with theater education is if I teach your child about a race issue in the midst of teaching a play, and then your child gets pulled out because I went too deep, or I talked about issues that not every child should be listening to or hearing at whatever age they are. And ultimately, if those conversations aren't being had in the household, my one hour class with your child does not change anything. Or if it does, I had too deep of a conversation with a child and the parent feels, oh, she's too radical. She's too this, she's too that. And I think from the education side of things, it is a very, very thin line that we have to straddle because these are conversations we have at home with our own families or have incidents that happen within our households and have witnessed with friend groups or anything like that. So theater is an educational tool and I do feel it can absolutely teach people who want to be taught. And I do think it's a really great way to help children understand the world that's happening around them. But what theater has devolved into is being PC and keeping donors happy instead of doing the work we came to do, instead of actively working on talking about the issues. Because for so long, that's what it felt like. Theater was about what's going on in this world around us because we didn't have television. We didn't have Netflix that I could binge watch all day long. But notice that everybody in, in the world right now is excited because Hamilton's coming. So it, it's intriguing to me how we can use theater as a tool. We can have these conversations. We can take the educational aspect and teach people, but I can't teach someone who doesn't want to learn. I can't teach someone who I worry if I go have a conversation with you about how I'm treated in a rehearsal that I'm never gonna be cast again. The opportunities for people who look like me are few and far between in the grand scheme of things. So if I have to worry that if I speak out on an issue or I had a bad experience and I try to bring it to whoever within the organization and there's some fear of retribution, why are people not speaking out? Because the people at the top side of it all aren't educated or don't want to be or oh that doesn't happen here in our theater but it has but it has so i think the educational aspect is kids may want the knowledge but i have to be comfortable enough to give the knowledge to these children in the school setting or just an educational production through our company and i have to know that i'm going to have the support from the parents at home not just having to say oh well this is why you can't make this reference or this is why you can't say that to this person well i don't like what you said to my child so that's it there goes their education and so everything i did kind of falls on deaf ears that that can be a big hurdle for any teacher i mean theater or you know regular education general education as well um that's always going to be a barrier especially as a black educator and an Afro-Latina educator, I confuse it. I confuse my students like crazy. They're like, wait, you're black and you speak yeah. Spanish? Ah, oh, shocking. Spanish? So, you know, it's, <laughs> you know, but also, you know, exposing them to that, to that new identity. And honestly, most of my lessons, because of the way that I work with my students, ends up going to be able to teach them how to interact with people who are different from them. More so than anything, that's, that's what I'm doing is I'm trying to make sure that they have empathy before they leave my classroom at least a taste of it you know like we're gonna read this book it's got 20 different characters in it yes 20 yes 20 
and you're gonna learn about them all and you will find one person in that book that you identify with and every single time they do. So it's about exposing them, at least for me, to different things. But honestly, as also as a black female educator, I'm not gonna sit up here and say, oh, that's what I do and it's super easy and I don't face any retribution or anything from it. No, there's always pushback, either pushback from parents, pushback from admin. I mean, I had an, an, an issue where a kid said the N word um so yeah hmm. so um parents were called or whatever whatever but they had never seen me so they didn't know i was black and i was walking into the meeting and i could hear them like oh well, we didn't know she was black and i was like i'm not going to this meeting i'm not gonna you're not gonna listen to me so i'm not gonna do this or put myself in that position where i'm going to be unsafe and i think that's um something that we also need to consider that that might be what happening to our our actors of color our bi cutie poc actors they may be going through some things that may put them in a traumatic situation. What levels of trauma are different for everybody, of course. But if they've already been racially traumatized in one setting, how are we then to expect them to show up to any gate kept audition? That's just a rhetorical question. Who thinks for? <laughs> Anybody else want to add on to this this um, idea of how intersectional intersectionality affects students in theater and education? Kia. I look at it a little bit partially because I just have left college, but at the college lens, I think that colleges and, and I don't know how everything is right, but I in both my college experiences, which, you know, were not terrible. They were good. They were they were good. But I saw issues of like you were saying, there's that feeling of we're doing it's I find it odd that it's like, why are we not doing plays in college that actually pertain to us, right? Or if you're going to do plays that are maybe a little bit, not, I wouldn't say outdated, but they're a little bit older, they're teaching us something, right? Because I go, I agree with Kings where it's like, why are we doing plays that we don't know, we, it's like, we don't know, we don't, we don't feel anything from this that much. And then it's like, but it makes the donors happy. It's like, but our donors, what we're doing this for? Who are you doing this for, right? I think for educational systems and for a lot of things, you should really ask yourself the question of like, why do we need to exist? Mm -hmm. And if you can't answer that question, then you really shouldn't be doing it. Um, but I think in colleges, it's like there has got to stop this whole thing of like, you will take this role because if you don't take this role, I will destroy you. And it's like, it's like, as somebody who's like in their 20s, it's like, how am I supposed to feel like I have any start when I'm being forced to essentially play a role that I know that I don't, I don't have any business doing but you're making me do it because you're saying that I'm going to gain something from this. And it's like, am I though? Am I, right? And so I think that with education, it's like, I think, you know, asking what are your students, what are you trying to teach your students before you put them out in the world? You know, I'm looking at through college, but it's just like, what do you want them to take away when they graduate, when they go, yeah, I'm an alumni of blank. They're going to go, I learned this, 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 and that. And it's like, for some reason we're going, well, it's college. And it's like, no, start start it there right because if you start there when they enter the real world they have all the resources that they can to begin and then they jump in but you know it's a it's a system but that that's just that's just me that's just me that's a good point it is still a system when we're still under that op that we're still operating under that system regardless of however much empathy we put in how much love we pour in how much understanding and empathy we have the system is not fixed there's only so much that we can do i get what you're saying um august did you have your hand up Okay, I was just making sure I don't want to like skip over anybody or silence any voices in here. I'm hearing lots of good things. I'm learning a lot and it's feeling very, very safe. And I do appreciate you all for that. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, no, just it, um, more, more in terms of uh, actor training since Kian brought it up, you know, it's uh, we are a body of culture, you know, each person is a body of culture. And that's that's who's walks into the room to to be vulnerable to share um and that's what we have to work as, as teachers as, as directors as divisors as theater makers you know we why why try to impose some sort of european model uh, on on your body why why not take advantage of of the things that you do have to offer and what that does acknowledging that what that does to the theater pieces and to the audience that comes and see it, instead of having us be some somebody, even though 
people might say, well, that's the role of an actor, but then you choose to do it and you, you find ways to do things that are not uh, the traditional theater school. Great, thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. And also, I'm not sure if you've seen this meme. I don't know if that's what it's called anymore. I haven't been on the internet in a minute. Um, but <laughs> there was this thing floating around about um, this incoming BFA program and there were no people of color in that photo and it was talking about the barriers to getting a good theater education especially for people who are of lower um, lower to middle lower middle class or working class people and so I think sometimes we also forget that class can be a barrier to theater we like to think that it isn't because it's supposed to be for everyone but how do we as theater artists, and I think we kind of ask this question and kind of keep talking back to this, is how do we make it not only engaging and meaningful to our community, but how do we also make it accessible? How do we make it so that people from our communities can go? I mean, I know so many people like, oh, it's too expensive. I don't have the money. I don't have the time. I have to dress up and wear something nice. I don't have it. So there's all of these barriers that people keep referencing and I see it I understand it but how do we break those down what should we do as a theater community or as an, an individual Candace so um I'm from Miami and one program we had because we always had to watch a play every like month or something like that in high school but our teacher and I will always be so grateful for her because she always treated me like one of her own and one thing she implemented was this thing, it was called Culture Shock, and it was a website you could go to and get like $5 tickets to major shows for students. I know, right? It sounds crazy, but it was amazing. And I was so grateful for it looking back on it because I got to see shows at, at the big theaters in, in Miami. And that was amazing because I'm like, as a theater kid who, you know, my parents were definitely middle class. I could have asked them for all the money, but I wanted to be independent and all that good stuff. And I also know they, they had three kids, they got bills to pay, they've got all this stuff going on. So in that era of independence, I, I was able to buy those tickets on my own. And that was something looking back for friends of mine who maybe weren't of the means was way more feasible and way more accessible than being able to buy a $25 ticket, especially for when you talk about those underserved communities, so many of the kids in those families have jobs at early ages to help pay bills, to help keep the lights on, to help with basic human needs. And I know this can bring a whole political discussion and I'm not gonna bring it there. I'm gonna bring it to how we as theaters can help. There used to be, at least when I was young, um, there used to be days where you could have the schools come in to see theater and there was no cost. It was just a field trip and they get bust in and it was, it was a guaranteed thing from this one theater and it was Gable stage and we'd go every year, every like time they had a new kid show and it would be like a theater for young audiences. And it was amazing. And I loved that. And it's a, a memory I will always cherish because I saw the, some amazing shows. So I really think that as a theater community, that's something we could institute to help make theater accessible. And another thing we had, um, cause funny story, I used to want to be a military person. My mom said no. <laughs> um, and I'm sure she's watching and is enjoying this story, but I, um, I didn't decide I was going to pursue theater as like my career path until my senior year. We had something called Florida Theater Conference. And what they did is they brought all of the schools that were interested in kids in theater, all the colleges, they brought them to one city, I think it was Orlando. And we basically all got to audition for 30 different schools at once. And that's your first round. So then I don't have to go to my school multiple times. I only have to go one time for the callback. And that saved a lot of money, but I went to school in Tallahassee. So it was not a, a really in, inexpensive place to get to, but I was of the means. So I had the ability to get up there. But when I saw what that young lady posted about that musical theater program, I'm like, it's really interesting how I saw a lack of diversity in the musical theater programs versus the acting programs. Yeah. And the year I came in, I think it was eight or nine of us. And they were like, oh, you guys are the most diverse class we've ever had because five of us were not white. And I think that that speaks volumes to the schools want to do this, but they have to go out and do the work and get the people and go into the communities that they're interested in, not to say, well, you have to come to us because everyone's not able. And now with people changing things for COVID, you can accept a video audition. 
you can accept a video audition. You can accept a Zoom audition. If people can do their dissertations this way, then you can do that to help kids who want to come to your school, who want to, you know, create a legacy through your college or your institution, whatever it may be, you can help them get there. You have to be willing to do so. And a lot of it is on the educator's side, on the admin side. The deans of the schools need to be making these decisions. They need to say, you know what? This person can do it or that person can do it or everyone first round because financially it is a lot to ask of people to come out to your school, especially if they want to audition for multiple schools. If I could have gone to school in New York, I probably would have, but that's a lot of money. Also, depending on the state they're in. You were saying you were in Kansas, right? Uh, How many art schools are in Kansas? Uh, <laughs> uh, one. And like when I walked in, for example, for a show that they were doing, immediately they're like, your cast. And I was my stupid self. Yay! I just yeah. walked in the room and I got a job. Mm, right. Mm, don't cool. do that anymore. I've learned. Now I know to like ask questions. <laughs> what is this role? What am I doing? Mm -hmm. So now I know better, but that's just how it was back then. I mean, and, and unfortunately it wasn't even that long ago. I hate to say that that's how it was back then. And I'm like, not that old. I'm not gonna say how old I am, right. but I'm not that old. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so that's interesting. And, and I also want to just thank you all for, for sharing those thoughts. Anybody have any more they wanted to add on that accessibility issue? Because I also, I mean, the first play I saw was in Kentucky and I was six and I, it was only because it was pre premiering at the Performing Arts Center in our town. And it was once on this island and it was cast correctly, thank goodness, because that could have thrown off everything for me. It was that show that did it for me that made me want to do theater. I was like, what is this magic? And I, I was hooked ever since. And you just never know. I mean, representation of course was great but also i want to make sure that we know that representation is good in everything but it, if all we have is representation it's still not enough but that really spoke to me seeing this young black woman just dancing across the stage telling this beautiful story is what got me and if i had not had that at that moment i don't know if i would be in theater i'm i mean i don't know that's what started it all for me so thank you anybody else want to add on to that before I move on, just want to make sure. Go ahead, Keon. Yeah, there's a, I think, I think um, marketing really changes uh, how you get people to show up. Mm -hmm. um, I, so in my directing class I had at San Diego State, uh, I was very lucky to have Jessica Prancio, if you don't know who she is, she's wonderful. She was a professor and she brought in um, the artistic director, one of the artistic directors from the Movement Theater Company in New York um and he was telling us about how i think they I'm, i feel terrible i can't remember oh i feel terrible um but anyways they were telling us about how basically they had a show i can't remember the name right now i feel terrible it was at the public theater but it was about the black experience in america right and they were like we're in harlem but we don't know how to access and make this something that the black community in harlem is going to want to attend and feel like they should they belong in the space like it's like oh i'm gonna go and it's like my two white friends and it's like oh or like you know my two black friends it's like a, a room full of white people i don't feel like i belong here right they're like we want to make sure that this show is calling and is accepting and saying we see you black community of harlem please show up and so they scrapped their marketing plan and what they did was they went into like a bunch of random places like like liquor stores and grocery stores and and everything, but they would put this thing that said, you know, leave a love letter to a black person. And it's like, you know, take that and then come see the show and see how that is incorporated into that show, right? Now, that's one amazing example, but I think that, you know, it requires us to think out of the box because it's like something like that does speak volume. Something like that, you go, oh, well, I'm interested now. And not only am I being interactive and I'm a part of this, but then I get to see my creation also on stage and then enjoy the show itself, right? And, and learn something from it and experience something from it rather than like face value, I saw it, talked about it, went to sleep, moving on. Like now it's like, I have been a part of this from a very beginning start. So I think just like starting to incorporate how we want people to feel, right? You know, because theater is an experience. It's not just, you know, like dance and song or just deep acting. It's like, it, we, you want people to walk away gaining something. So what do you want them to gain and how do you get them to do it? So something like that, yeah. 
Those are good questions. I mean, those are questions that any theater or any like artist should think about that. What do you want your audience to get from this? What is the point of it? How is it going to benefit them? And the way that you were talking about that theater experience, it sounded even more beyond engagement. It was investing. They had invested a piece of themselves in it. And to see that come to fruition on stage, especially if your voice has been marginalized, can be very meaningful and extremely powerful. That is a very, very cool thing. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, anybody else? Okay. All right, so now let's get to a little bit more about this action stuff because so we're, that's kind of where we've been anyway. Um, we were talking about the marketing, definitely want to make sure that we're not pandering. I'm not gonna go to where I normally go with my examples, but my favorite ones are when people try to speak Spanish, Spanish poorly, they'll say, ya basta. And it's like, mm -mm, mm -mm, that doesn't work for me. So, so we have to think about how we, how we market to people, how we communicate with people. So as theater artists, just I wonder, what is it that we can do either as, individ as individuals, as individuals, what can we do to respect and protect each other in our, in our theater community, respect and protect other BIQD POC artists in our theater community. What are some things that we can do, just one person, one, one person can do? A big one. Candace. I have a very difficult time, particularly when I do Black literature, um, as a Black woman, when um, artists use the N-word, even if it's in the script, through the rehearsal process. Um, if it's in the script, it's the playwright's words, but I do feel like the weight of it now is very different. And I feel like through the rehearsal process is one thing, but in the show, it's a, it, we need to stick to the script 100%. And I think acknowledging that and having that open conversation, you've never met me before we go into a rehearsal process and you throw on the N-word at me and it's like, whoa, wait a minute, can, 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 can we talk about this? Can we talk about your relationship to it, my relationship to it? Um, because I do feel like, in theater, we become a family, mm -hmm. but it is difficult when there isn't a space that's carved in the rehearsal process for us to have a discussion as two human beings, me and the person in the scene or whatever it may be, as well as that discussion with the director. Um, having those open dialogues with your cast, having the open dialogue when picking the show, having the open dialogue too of how does that change things for your actor? And also making sure they have somewhere, a nice like, cushiony place to fall, whether it's a mental health professional who gets brought in um, or an intimacy director, there should be someone who you have around for shows that deal with race issues and having those check-ins. I, I wanna always feel comfortable being able to go to an actor and say, are you okay? And if you're not, please tell me and I will get you what you need. Because for some of us, it's easier than others. But that could just be that one bad day that that actor is having. That could be, you know, the one difficult experience, whether it's a show that has sexually charged things or race charged things, it doesn't matter to me. We have to protect each other and also checking in with your fellow actors if you wanna take some personal accountability or checking in with whoever. Um, there's nothing worse than when you have to have a scene that's very emotionally charged or sexually driven. And then you feel like you've just been let go with all of your emotions unchecked. And I, I feel like that would be one way that we could help each other in this industry as well. That's awesome. Yeah, I've been thinking the same, like there needs to be some a mediator or something that they can that we can feel comfortable going to like we would with an intimacy coordinator. It might feel a little bit safer, especially if you're doing something a piece that has racially and sexually charged violent scenes or racial and sexually charged scenes in general because those kind of things will bring out different things in different people and may be triggering for some. And it's important for us to all know these boundaries, but if we've never talked about these boundaries, we're just gonna pretend that they're not there and bulldoze past them. So that's one way we can definitely create a safe environment for each other. Thank you so much. Anybody else, what can we do as an individual theater artist to, to respect and protect BIQD POC in our community? Daniel. I think uh, the, the, the main thing is to listen, you know, listen to, to the people in the room, embrace the intersectional nature of the people that you bring into the room to, to play with you. And, um, and really, um, and, and, and a constant check-in. I think this, this acknowledging what the trigger words are, are for the people in the room is very, um, 
it has to happen immediately uh, to gain that trust, to gain that 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 confidence on on. So so a person, so an actor can give everything they need to give. I mean, I do that with with playwrights. If I go through the script and I say, "Hey, is, do you really mean this? This is what it would mean." When I do translations, hey. That word in Spanish is very different than this than, than this word, even though that's the literal translation. You know, what do you do, and the impact that we will have with our community, both of artists and audiences. Um, that is that is step one. You know, to listen and to be aware of everybody's perceptual nature. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah, that's that empathy coming from that place of empathy. Nice. Anybody else? Cool. Um, okay, so, Kian, did you have your hand raised? Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I, I had a last minute okay. thought, but I, it's a simple one. I should I shouldn't say that, but it's like believing in something. Do you know what I'm saying? And and like I go back to what I was saying, where it's like you know, being in auditions, and you see the people you see, right? And you maybe see somebody that you're going, okay, I know this person very well, versus I know don't know this person very well but it's like i'm going to believe in you and i'm going to believe that you came here with a passion you came here with a drive you came here with a reason to be here and i'm going to take you under the wing and go let's do it right and like candace and danielle were saying you know like when i direct it's like anybody who knows me knows that it's like i do three things i will never start the rehearsal without asking how are you it is the most important thing to me because i'm like i cannot approach this if i don't know if we're not all good we have to start we i can't go forward because i'm like if we're not good then none of this matters because we ha we're we here to do this together. If one of us is off, take a moment. It's not stopping the process, right? Like, it's like we have to take it back to a, a, a human approach, right? But then as well, you know, some people may be like, it's too PC, make safe words, right? Make safe words that you say for yourself, right? For the individual actors, but then make safe words for the room because maybe the room's feeling bad, maybe you're feeling bad, you say it, move them anyways. But it's like believing and loving in what you do no matter what, right? Even if you don't know the play very well, maybe you love a certain word in that play. Maybe you love the fact that the playwright said, you know, you cannot, you know, I don't know, you have to play Beyonce, my, my player, otherwise you won't do it. I don't know, but it's just like, it's, it's being reminded about why we love the things we do and why we love working with the people we love, right? Because if you can't do that, then it's like, you're just a bunch of people with your ideas, your closed mind, and then it's just clash. Um, so it's like going back to the human of humanity of it all and reminding ourselves why we believe in it, why we choose to return to it, why we love to it, I think is is a little hippie, but I think it's very important. I think that's a very artist way to answer that question. I mean, there's that part of us that just continues to believe no matter what. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about us. August. Oh, um, I was thinking, um, when I was trying to think about what we can do to support uh, the IPOC, um, I think, um, this might be a common thing, but if uh, you don't want to be seen as the uppity one, um, you don't want to be seen as um, uh, someone through likely through ignorance um, has um, said something or done something or put themselves in such a position as to like make you feel uneasy because we know that like most people won't say that they're racist, but we don't know if they're actively anti-racist and that they'll listen to listen to like concerns because uh it can be brushed off of like oh thank you for um oh yeah sure or um i don't know i don't know but like um and then there's this tension of look at who are in the pos people in the positions of power in theater uh and who is like the like most vulnerable for um trying to like kick up the dust or say something um the acknowledgement that um some people like it um that it can be uncomfortable for people of color to bring up issues and to make it clear that like mm. uh, that your um, production, your organization, whatever is um, dedicated to like anti-racism and doing like doing your best to grow rather than being like, oh yeah, we're not racist. Let's not talk about race anymore. Um, I think, um, yeah, the producing an environment in which you're not seen as someone who's causing a problem for speaking up against uh, about something that you thought was like maybe problematic and it doesn't even have to be like 
big things, but oftentimes it's the little things that are like the hardest to uh, discuss because they, um, it's hard to seem like you're not making a mountain out of a molehill. That's a great point. Um, I was in a production with some other people and we were asked to do a certain type of makeup and the other actress was just not very comfortable with it because of her background. And that was one of the points when I was like, I don't know why, but it was easier for me to stand up for her than it was for me to stand up for myself in other times. But I think it was also because she felt safe enough to confide in me that that was an issue. And so that helped. But I mean, if we don't talk to each other, I mean, we gotta, we gotta make sure we have each other's back. I got y'all back. We in a show, I got y'all back. So I just wanna make sure that's out there. I have your back. Um, you, so that's the other thing, you know, making sure that we also know that we have each other's safety net or even having a person, as we, we mentioned before, that we can go to, to help us navigate those issues. Somebody that we won't feel would blacklist us per se because of us bringing up something that is genuinely bothering us. Um, another question that I have, um, where did it go? Okay, actually, I'm gonna take this question from an audience member because this is a, is a good, good question. Um, as a cis, white, homosexual theater goer and supporter, what can I do to be an ally or accomplice these efforts to help you, to help people get these efforts, accomplish these efforts, excuse me. August. Um. I um, go to school in Minnesota, uh, so I have a lot of white friends. Um, and I think um, a concern for a lot of people who want to do good and acknowledge their privilege, which is like, all right, first step, solid. Thank you for like caring about being a good person and wanting to like show solidarity with like BI uh, POC. That's greatly appreciated. And there's a lot of people who don't even take that first step. Um, I think part of it is um, the, there's a tricky place um, for allies and accomplices, I think, in the sense that um, don't, um, the rule is generally don't speak over like the people who are the leaders on issues, like don't speak up over black, don't make the central voice of a Black Lives Matter protest a white person. Um, but at the same time, uh, you have to make sure to be like engaged in like have a voice, have a voice that is in unison, just not speaking over. I sometimes feel that um, when talking about race, um, that um, some of my white friends will want to step back and like, oh, I'm like, they're scared of being racist, which like is appreciated. Um, but um, that fear allows them to sort of detach themselves from the argument of like, oh, I'm not going to say anything. It's like, no, I want you to one, listen to the people who you're an ally to, and then like, um, hear what they have to say and like rely upon like the works and the theories and the thoughts of people who are like in the struggle um, and allow your voice to contribute to theirs uh, and engage with these dialogues with people and talk. Um, another big thing is that um, I, I think I saw a statistic a while ago that most white people are only ever like only friends with like other white people, at least in America. And so um, there are some people that I'm just not going to reach. Um, and the a lot of the ways that we like work to dismantle like the biases of other people um, is through conversation and dialogue and not being afraid to actually jump into the discourse for fear of being racist. You won't be racist if you listen to like um, the right voices. Good point. Yep, just listening, making sure that you are falling back when you need to fall back, letting us take the lead if we need to take the lead. Candace, I saw your hand up first, go ahead. I just wanna piggyback off of August's comment because I think um, that education thing is really important, but also not coming to us and making us your educators. Um, I'm happy to have a dialogue, but I'm not going to sit here and like have to spoon feed you your own resources. Everyone is capable of Google. Um, and it's, it's really just that plain and simple. So please don't, don't be afraid to talk to me about things and dialogue with me, but please don't ask me to send you all the links to the books and the stuffs because you could do that on your own time. Amen. Yes. All right, Daniel, did you have your hand raised? There we go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think, um, yeah. Do your own work. 
However, I believe that since we are an organized panel or something like that, I would I could propose that we could have a place where we could link at least a lot of the resources that helped me. Uh, because being a white Mexican, I, I had so much privilege that I didn't really know I had uh, because privilege uh, is usually blind for those that have it, you know, so how to learn to, to acknowledge that you have it and how it affects your day to day life and relationships. Um, donate, donate to groups uh, that are really uh, led by, by, by BIPOC people and, and are for justice. Um, stand up when you see injustice, call it out, uh, like Andrea said. It's easier for you to defend a, a BIPOC person than, than us that are going through the trauma at that one moment. You stand up for them. Um, again, learn your privilege. Uh, listen without having the answer already before you finish uh, hearing what, what, the, what we have to say. Um, uh, don't assume that we don't know anything and um, or that we fit some sort of stereotype that you might have grown up with. Don't assume that and um, educate yourself. You know, there's so many resources right now out there. Um, let's start with white fragility um, to get to know yourself. You know, there's um, there's there's many. Yeah. So thanks. Thanks for caring and asking about that question, because uh, Sometimes we do, there's so much that we don't know what to do. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, and I do want to piggyback off of that just real quick um, that there will be some resources available for you all later on, but go ahead, Keon. Um, yeah, Danielle, everybody said it like so beautifully, like mwah. Um, I think the only thing I, I think I would add is like, I had a lot of discussions um, you know, with, with white count, with white friends, you know, especially, specifically like white homosexual friends who, you know, um, don't, don't know what to do. Or they're like, I don't, I'm, I don't have any, like, do you have any answers? And, and I would agree that it's like, I don't think that you should come to me. For instance, I think we can have a, a dialogue, but it's like, yes, like if you can Google how to recipe, if you can Google, you know, some TV show, you can Google your resources. But I think as well, it's, it's I, like um, August said, acknowledging your privilege, right? Um, and like Candace and Danielle said, listening and taking the time to do it right. But then once you understand that, understand that you do have a platform. Like a platform, you have a platform, right? We all, we all do, right? And it's like responsibly use that platform to bring about things that other people may not know, right? And it's not you getting on your high horse or being like, well, I am better than you because I did this thing. And so <laughs> me, I'm flawless. It's like, no, 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 no. Remember that we all have imperfections. We all have things that we could still be better at, you know, learn more about. But at the end of the day, let your platform be something to blossom and possibly highlight somebody else that has not had that chance, you know, that, that has been ignored or has been put aside or has been too afraid, uplift someone. Just it's it really is the small, small things that, you know, we've kind of turned a blind eye to. But now it's like, let that, let that, let that small thing, even so much as being like, can I support, I want to read your play, or I want to see the small, I just want to, I want to know more about your art. I want to believe in your art. I want to love in your art. I'm going to support your art. So, yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. Yes. So there's lots of things that allies can do. Make sure to look things up. I do want to let you know that some of your BI cutie pop friends are exhausted. Um, for some of us, we have been, you know, already living it for so long, but then keeping it bottled up and kind of hiding it so we can put on that brave face when we go to work every single day. But now since everything is up, it's kind of messing with some of us a little bit. Some of us may be feeling a little bit down. Some of us may be still angry. So be careful when you reach out to your black friends if you're only asking them, you know, how to be an ally. This might not be the best time to reach out to that friend. Do the work. I believe in you. We'll get you some resources to at least start you off in the right direction. Hopefully you can pick it up and take it from there. Um, so just to bring it back real quick, I want to ask as a theater community, how can we promote anti-racist practices? Do we do that within our own organization? Can we help other organizations? How do we spread this kind, this, these practices? How do we make it commonplace? <laughs> Daniel. I mean, the first one is uh, given the structure of theater, uh, um, larger theaters anyway, you have to rebuild. 
uh, uh, don't allow people in your board unless they take anti-racist training. You know, there's, 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 I'll, I'll remind me to give you a link to, to a couple of that are happening. Um, there's organizations like Art Equity that, that, that focuses on that. And that's, that's the first one. You know, the other, the other thing is if you uh, have an arts and uh, uh, community engagement program, make sure that, that you are, um, it's more of a community justice uh, thing than an engagement because, you know, we've stolen land, we've done this and we've done that. Who knows? They're not ready to, for us to go to their place and put them into our world and our rules. So, so really, uh, your education department and your engagement department need to really um, serve the community in their terms and not necessarily on building our structures. Um, yeah, those two came to mind. I love that, serving the community on their terms. If you're in that community, you serve those people. Very nice. All right, anybody else? Kian. I think, as crazy as it may seem, rewrite your mission statement, right? Look at your mission statement. Think about the past, I don't know how many years you've had your company, or think about the future you want to have, and take the, take the mission statement you have and rewrite it. Mm. And think about, like, has this, has, has this thing that I created actually, have I actually done that? And if I haven't, I need to acknowledge it and rewrite it and make one for the future, right? Or if you don't want to do that, just go, this is where I've messed up, right? This is our mission statement. This is where we failed. This is where we missed, we, 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 we were blind or we missed a step or we just, we lost what we, we, what our intentions were. But now we're going to revisit it and we're going to promise and put forward that action. Um, and as well, oh no, I lost the thought. What was it? Oh, um, write a manifesto. Like, write a manifesto for yourself, right? A manifesto, maybe it's all theater companies, right? You write a manifesto that says, the future of theater, the new theater will be inclusive. The new theater will, 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 will you know, champion its youth. The new theater will be, you know, about risks and change and whatever. But just, I think, challenging those things that we know are under the surface, now bring them to the table and going, all right, let's do this. So. Nice, nice. All right. Oh, Danielle, go ahead. Just another thing that popped into my mind was that um, inclusion um, and and having a diverse staff doesn't make you diverse or inclusive. What you have to do, you have to really change the structure and, and the power of listening. Uh, we've tried that already. Everybody has two Mexicans and two African Americans in the room and the organizations don't change. So you have to change the room. You have to change the conversation dynamics. Yeah. You do. Thank you. Go ahead, Candace. I just you just described like the Noah's Ark of theater. You've got two of this. You've got two of that, and that's why it's okay. Um, but I did want to um, just just mention too, as far as structures and that rebuild and going back to donors. Please stop taking money that has an attachment. Oh, I'm going to give you this check, but oh, you got to do this show. You've got to hire this person you can say no you can say no and you can live well knowing you know what i i i did right by the community we're here to serve so um that's my two cents on that matter i appreciate it thank you august i'm still trying to um formulate my thoughts about this but i thought um about something interesting or like where are the homeless um, theaters performing? Where uh, the, and what can, like everyone, every theater who has a home, what can they do? And like talking about intersectionality, um, there um, are places, um, or there are companies that like, don't have like permanent places to stay. And what can your company like do to allow them space? Um, especially maybe if they're like a black theater company. Um, uh, because you know a lot of time the theater is empty uh and hey if it's not being used why not let other people do it just um 
a redoubled effort for like solidarity if we're like also talking about intersectionality collaboration between um different um like theater companies perhaps and um i also really liked um, the example of going out into like communities and making it feel as like not that um as if it's theater is something like outside oh hey i'm interested this is like of my people and therefore I can like see myself participating um, because Andrea I think we talked about like um, how you don't know any like black lighting designers um, and so or at least in San Diego um, and I think part of that is it's um, one thing for um, there to be some someone who sees themselves on stage and like wants to be an actor but if we're talking about um, changing power structures like why will like why would like a poc want to become like um like a lighting designer or like um things like that if they don't feel that theater as a thing rather than being an actor is something that is valuable and important to them right yeah we need to open all lines of the theater up to up to people like i just found out one of my students who originally wanted to be an actor when i put her on the light board she's like no i want this now so you never know <laughs> what they're going to like and if you can give them an opportunity to experience something new you've opened up a whole new world to them and that's what i wanted that's what i prefer for us to do so we only have time for about one more question it's the last one all right oh daniel you have a so, yeah no i just wanted to make sure that that uh, when you do reach out to, to these theaters of, of color, like Penumbra and theaters that 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 um, just to help them with their process, make sure you're doing it because you really want to uh, participate in that community and not necessarily because you want the grant money. And that's a big thing that that the back office in a theater can do too. So making authentic connections with your community they're not just a paycheck okay so like we have to treat them like they're actually people and that we care about them and how that they support us and are building a community together thank you so much for including that um so last one how do you feel about call out culture relative to racism in the theater is it useful is it not that's <laughs> okay I think August, okay, it's August. I have a lot of thoughts because, um, <laughs> you know, as uh, Gen Z, um, I um, call it culture and like, especially like in this internet era are, is a very, it's, there's a lot to unpack with it uh, because, you know, the critique of call out culture is that um, it is sort of um, like a blind, like mob rage against someone who may have done something wrong once uh, and that there is like no chance for like the opportunity for growth of someone who's like being called out um, and that it like is like unjust. But on the other hand, uh, the reason why like call out culture is a weird sort of thing is, is uh, or it seems like a weird thing to describe is because, okay, it's a culture of pointing out people who have like done something harmful and like, you know, exists within p positions of power and those who are in positions of power have like the opportunity to do more harm given their position. And there's like, you're like building a culture around trying to like hold people accountable and that's something worthy of critique. Um, and so you have like these two sorts of tensions. Um, I think that um, largely um, being able to, I think the criticism is important in the sense that we need to understand that people can be racist at one point and then stop being racist at another point, uh, that we need to allow the uh, opportunity for like genuine growth and accountability. Um, part of this moment is not so much like we need to like punish the white people who did racism, uh, but it's more about, listen, there's trauma uh, and damage and harm and systems of imbalance and um, unjust like hierarchies of power. How can we like move forward? Because the past has already happened. There's only the forward that we can look forward to. And being like vindictive is not going to necessarily, it may make you feel better, but not lead to a better future. And I only care about, you know, um, making sure that like everyone else has, is having as good a time as possible. 
uh, and not having to deal with racism. Um, so call outs are important for allowing people to know what is incorrect behavior, but it doesn't need to like follow like with a demonization. And if they show accountability for their actions and like seem genuine, uh, I like I believe in growth. Um, when, like, yeah, I've had friends who've been like, oh yeah, August, I was racist. But, and, but like when I, I was racist before, but I'm not now. And I'm like, yeah, I believe you're not racist right now. Thank you for like telling me that. Um, <laughs> uh, so growth, but accountability. Love that growth, but accountability. All right, Candace. I mean, I definitely agree. It's one of those things that I don't really love call out culture, I'll be honest, because there's so much more. I'm, I don't know if it's because I'm a millennial and I was around before like the social media got really big, but I do think there there's that level of going to someone and saying, hey, what you did hurt me. Hey, what you did uh, didn't work for me. What you did or said was a microaggression because of X, Y, and Z. I'd rather be able to have that dialogue. Now, if that dialogue was had and it continues to happen, then I'm all for you want to put somebody on blast and do what you need to do. But I, I firmly believe there's so much more that can be done on the admin side of it, particularly in theater. But the issues that have come up and why I feel so many people have used call out culture is because nothing has been done. Nothing has been rectified. Action hasn't been taken. So it goes back to our original points of accountability and communication. If I'm communicating to you, I don't like this, this was racist, what you did hurt me as a black person or as a woman, as anything else that anyone identifies as, then I should be able to come to you and say that, whether I'm an actor, whether I am a tech person, whether I'm front of house, I don't care who you are in that theater community. But if I can't go to management or executive leadership within that organization and say what you did was wrong and here is why, and not have to fear retribution or the only way I know I can get results is going on Facebook and talking about you, mm. then what, what else can I do? I can't file a police report for racism because it wasn't a hate crime that you, you know, said whatever you said. But yet, I can hold you accountable. So if I'm coming to you to hold you accountable, take that in, embrace that, affect some change within your organization, and call it a day. We move on. But the problem is so many people have done that. And they've tried to go through those proper channels and they've been met with, if you will, a slammed door. So if the only way I can get you to institute some change is by going on whatever and calling you out, and that's the only way I can do it, then so be it. But um, I ultimately think go through the proper channels first, do what you can, file the necessary complaints, bring it to whoever the higher ups are, because, you know, ultimately, that's, to me, the best way to do it. But I'm just one person. Thank you. We got you here for your insights. So. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And actually, we're a little bit over time. So I want to thank you all <laughs> for your lovely insight. I want to thank you attendees for the questions that you did submit. Um, thank you for being open and, and listening because that's part of it. We're building this bridge together. We have to meet somewhere with each other so that we can all get across and get forward together. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much. And this concludes our panel event. You will be receiving, attendees, you will be receiving a survey a little bit afterwards to give us some feedback, maybe ask some more questions that we could use at a later panel at a future date. Um, and I will be sending or will be sending out um, a link or an infographic that I compiled. I also put the link in the chat. So there's a, an infographic that I compiled if you would like to see some things. So I've done the research, so you don't have to ask too many people right now. You've got some things you can watch, you can listen to, you can read. There's even stuff to talk to with children about. So hope you have some place to start with there. And again, thank you all so much for this evening. It was great. I appreciate all of the voices here tonight. Thank you, panelists.